Brisbane City Council meeting and Brisbane Housing Authority meeting of May 2nd. If you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Please note for the record that all council members are present. Adoption of the agenda. I'd like to close in memory of longtime Brisbane resident Yvonne Creason. I move adoption with that. I'd like, to make, I'd like to make a change if we could to the presentation order and do the public works appreciation first. Um, and then the recology presentation, if possible. With that, I'd make a motion to. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 In terms of the agenda, you want to, the staff's requesting that we remove item 7B, and we will um, bring that back on June 6th. Do you need a new motion for that? Um, no, not really. Just, okay. Just so noted for the record. Item B under new business. Okay. So that brings us to declaring May 19th through 25th, 2019 as Public Works Appreciation Week. Uh, oral communications number one. Oh, my gosh. I'm all over the place tonight. It's all right. <laughs> oral communications number one. Is there any member of the public wishing to speak on an item not on the agenda? Seeing no hands. Okay, moving forward to presentations. Declaring this week as Public Works Appreciation Week or May 19th to 25th. Um, I'll go ahead and read the proclamation. A proclamation of the City Council of the City of Brisbane recognizing May 19th through 25th, 2019 as Public Works Week. Whereas Public Works Week is a celebration of the dedicated employees who provide and maintain the infrastructures and services collectively known as Public Works. And whereas the theme of National Public Works Week 2019 is It Starts Here, which reflects the many facets of modern civilization that grow out of the efforts put forth by public works professionals. And whereas the answer to that starts here includes infrastructure starts with public works, growth and innovation starts with public worth, works, mobility starts with public works, healthy communities start with public works, and whereas much of the foundation of the quality of life of Brisbane citizens begins with public works. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Brisbane does hereby proclaim May 19th through 25th, 2019 as Public Works Week, dated the second day of May. 2019. Thank you. So I have a. Sure, I'll, t I'll take that, ma'am, and I'll uh, take a few words if you don't mind. Absolutely. Honorable Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, good evening. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. We very much respect the support that you give us year round, and we appreciate the kind words that you give us every week for National Public Works Week. You, the two people, the two rows back here, the men and women, work very hard for this city, for your city, and in many cases for their city. And I, it's always nice to give them the support uh, that they deserve. And you know me that I always like to bring a little humor to the evening, though. So tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about stuff happens. Uh, and, and maybe if I could get the clerk to start to dim the lights and we're going to have to, we're going to bring something up here in a moment. So, so under the guise of stuff happens, I want to tell a story. It's a true story and it's a personal story. This happened to me about three decades ago. I was working for a water district in the early 1990s and we were working a terrible capital project. It was a major pipeline that fed three quarters of a county. We had all of their water lines shut off. They were having to exist on their reservoirs. We were working 24 hours a day. Myself and my inspection staff were working 12-hour shifts, and it was just brutal. And about halfway through, as I'm coming into work one morning, I get a call over the radio, because this is the early 90s. We didn't have cell phones. They weren't ubiquitous like they are now. And so this is a radio that anybody who has the frequency can hear. And he's telling me, boss, you're not going to believe this, but somebody has changed one of our changeable message signs on this main route. And he tells me what it says, and I can't believe it. It's so outlandish. So now I'm chewing him out over the public radio. So everybody that works for the water district can hear this. And all he says is, 
boss, could you just join me here? So I hustle out to that location. I flip on all my warning lights. I'm trying to cross four lanes of traffic. And ink would start to bring it up. And as I get turned around, this is what I see <laughs> on our changeable message sign. Except that the letters we've blotted out there weren't blotted out. This is on a road that had about 50,000 trips of traffic a day. <laughs> and the backstory is, back in the early 90s, not everybody had changeable message signs. In fact, very few people had them. So you had to get them out of a rental yard. And apparently some contractor had the key to program it. And he had gone in at night and changed the programming that we had put in that said road work ahead. Uh, because he didn't like the speed that people were doing. So we... We didn't even have a key to fix it. So between us, the two of us, we managed to just take this thing and we knock it over. We throw it in a ditch just, just to get rid of it. So I drive into the office and I thought, well, that's a, that's a pretty rough start to the morning. And at that point, the general manager sees me and says, hey, could you come in my office? I'm like, sure, sure, boss, why not? He goes, why have the mayors of the two adjoining cities called me and are telling me that their phones are ringing off the hook and their citizens are certain that the water district has intentionally tried to defame and defile their good name because people were calling in believing that we had done that intentionally to them. So I spent the rest of the morning writing letters of apology to the mayor, to two mayors. And then about noon, I get a call from the local Caltrans district, 60 miles away. What had happened was, again, it's the 90s. Someone had taken a picture of this. They had gone to their office and put it in a Xerox and then jammed it in one of the old fax machines, the old thermal copier paper machines we had and sent it to Caltrans District Headquarters. And one of the senior engineers calls me and goes, hey, Randy, did we have any projects going on on that street? I'm like, no, no, man, you Caltrans, you, you guys are good. You didn't have anything there. He goes, thanks so much. Oh, by the way, good luck with that. And he hangs up on me. So this has gone through history now, through the 90s. And the reason you see it on a plaque is it is a plaque that the California City's Public Works Department issues every year, and they give it to the one Public Works Department Whichever officer out of the 460, 470 of us in the cities have an incident that happens to him where it was something completely out of his control, but it's just funny. And the whole moral of this story is that sometimes stuff just does happen, and I appreciate very much the fact that our council recognizes that we don't do stuff like this, and so we just have to take a step back and say, we're going to make it better, we're going to continue to make it better, and that's what we always strive to do. Uh, and before I close this evening, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce uh, Justin Yoon to you. Justin Yoon, let's go ahead, stand up give, or give a wave, Justin. Justin is an assistant engineer. He's working on the transportation side of things. We first came in contact with Justin when he was a senior in high school. We managed to uh, get him on an MTC engineering internship. He made it through five different internships with us and still was not dissuaded from joining the department. So we're really happy to have him. It's good to have bright young talent on board, and we're looking forward to great things from him. So thank you very much, and I'll be sure to get the, uh, the proclamation later, ma'am. Madam Mayor, yeah. Randy, thank you for you and your crew and stuff, the, all the work that you guys do. Uh, but I do recall our signboard out there one time when you said sandbags available at City Hall. And some uh, bright citizen pasted wind over sand. <laughs> thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> uh, we're taking a photo of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that could be the outgoing council member uh, award. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe. Yeah. Award. But th thank you so much for uh, all the stuff that you guys do out there, guys and gals, you know, and uh, I mean, like the police department and fire department, uh, actually, you're probably more exposed than either of those two, you know, always being out there first on the street, inter intersecting with the neighbors and everybody else. So, you know, I already appreciate the hard work that you do. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming tonight and letting us honor you. And you are often our unsung heroes. So it's very special that we get to take the time out to recognize you and um, thank you for all the work that you do. I know that you probably get faced with all sorts of interesting challenges every day, um, and you do an excellent job. So thank you so much for all that you do for us. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for all the work you do. Um, you know, you guys are so professional that it always seems effortless for you. And um, 
you know, you know when you're doing a good job when people aren't complaining. And so, um, yeah, just thank you for doing it day in and day out. You guys are great. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Go ahead and move on to Recology's presentation on their development plans for the Brisbane. Thank you. For Brisbane and San Francisco. How to clear the room, Terry. Yeah. <laughs> No. Well. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council Members. My name is John Porter. I'm the Group Manager for Recology here in uh, San Francisco, Brisbane area. Uh, and uh, in meeting with uh, you know Clay and and, and John uh, Schwicky. Uh, we've been talking a lot about kind of our plans for the facility and uh, we thought it'd be appropriate to guys give you guys an update on where we're at and kind of where we're headed and um, our kind of anticipated future plans so um, please at any point in time feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions about what we're covering it's kind of a sequential discussion so happy to answer questions as we go through it uh, so as you can see above uh, this is kind of a look at our facility as it sits today uh, the county line between San Francisco and San Mateo County. Um, I'm sorry, if, do, you, do you guys have a view? Uh, you know, we don't have a view. Okay. Okay, cuts pretty much right through the middle of this picture. Um, and so th that's just kind of an aerial view. Most recently, we completed a 15,000 square foot uh, organics transfer station, just basically composting program. Uh, we call that the West Wing, which is on the west side of the transfer station. Uh, and so kind of looking at what you guys have, some of you have seen before, this was the 2014 project proposal. It's a very beautiful picture uh, and uh, kind of anticipated what we we're hoping to design. This is an overview of kind of the land that was necessary in order to make that vision possible. Uh, and the parcels A, B, C, and E are parcels that we do not currently own. So um, that kind of leads us to the challenges of, the, the footprint in order to fit the parking necessary for both our fleet and our employees, uh, we required that additional land. Um, but it's important uh, if you see that the, the West Wing, which is, it says here, this green uh, transfer station building, that has actually been built. The building north uh, or on the screen here, which is actually east, uh, is a transfer station that exists today. This is the East Wing, which you'll, we'll talk about shortly. Then there's a maintenance facility here, uh, and these, these other buildings exist today. The only building that, that is not part of our current plan is this recycling building, which is the largest additional building uh, planned in the 2014 proposal. Uh, and we're not able to plan for that building under our current vision of what the facilities will look like in, in a several years. Uh, and the reasons for that, you know, the construction costs of building on that land uh, going back for the recycling building. That's largely on historical landfill. Uh, and you know some of these other uh, constraints, it would cost in excess of a billion dollars. Uh, number two is we already have a viable facility for recycling, which is the, the Blue Stream uh, at Pier 96 in San Francisco. So recycling, a new recycling building isn't imminent, whereas construction and demolition is our largest opportunity for increasing our landfill diversion in San Francisco. Uh, we have a landfill reduction goal in San Francisco of 50% by 2030. Uh, and if we can, you know, uh, improve our construction and demolition facility, there's a real opportunity that we'll be able to accomplish that goal. Uh, and then lastly, as I mentioned, it, it required land that we don't own. So without that land, we aren't able to kind of complete that vision. We can't build that, that other large building. So that takes us to, to where we are today, the 2019 proposal. And so where are we in the process? We have submitted what is called a preliminary planning application, which is the application you file before you actually file an application, and you get kind of preliminary comments from the San Francisco Planning Department. Uh, we hope to submit a final application in the next month or so, um, and we've been working closely with your staff to kind of give them up-to-date information as, as this things progress and coordinate with them closely. Uh, go ahead. Yes, Terry. Sorry. Um, you said you're submitting that to San Francisco. Are you submitting it to San Francisco or to Brisbane? So uh, 
San Francisco, most of the construction is going to be happening on the San Francisco County side of the, of the project. And so we will be submitting the actual environmental planning process through San Francisco, but coordinating with, through Brisbane on the po portions of the project that are, will be happening in Brisbane. Okay, thank you. So, no problem. Great question. Uh, so this is kind of an aerial of what the 2019 uh, proposal will look like. So the buildings that don't exist today are what we're calling this the East Wing, which would be our construction and demolition facility, which is on the right side of uh, the visual. Okay, that, that's currently the pit? That does not exist today. The pit is? You, you, the pit exists here. It, it, that's the pit. Okay. This is what we call the IMRF, which is the Integrated Material Recoveries Facility, which is where we currently recycle construction and demolition material. This is about a 20-year-old facility. Okay. And then as we go further east, this is the new building, the East that Wing, will that. which will handle the C&D facility, a uh, C&D material. Mm -hmm. And then the plan is once we, because we're, C&D is not going to stop, we're going to continuously recycle construction and demolition material in this facility. Then once this, this new facility is built, we're going to tear out the equipment in here, and then we're going to build a trash processing facility in this footprint. So your traditional residue landfill cart, you know, what people consider trash, we're actually going to try to start recycling that material in that footprint. So that's kind of the logical flow. The other building that does not exist today is this uh, maintenance facility, which is on the southern uh, property line of Beatty. Uh, right now we have uh, five maintenance facilities, one on the footprint where the east wing is uh, there, uh, one that is here, one that's here, and then one that's here. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. Uh, and we're going to consolidate all of those maintenance facilities into one, ma one larger maintenance facility. And these legacy buildings that you're probably more than familiar with uh, on Beatty and inside the Bayshore building, as well as this uh, 505, 501 Tunnel Avenue, um, and this maintenance facility here on the southern side of Beatty will be demolished um, and, and, and consolidated into this one place. Then lastly, we are planning to build a uh, administrative office and parking structure uh, that will kind of take the place of 501, 401 tunnel, 505 tunnel, uh, and then the uh, temporary modular trailer at 515 tunnel. Uh, and we'll put that in, in that along the northern property line to isolate or insulate ourselves from the community of Little Hollywood. We look at that as a good buffer between our industrial use. So that's, that's kind of the, uh, the overview of what it will look like hopefully when it's all done. Oh, um, and uh, here's kind of just a, a, an easier way to, to see it visually. The purple or, or pinkish purple buildings are all the new buildings. Uh, anything not color, colored in is existing as it is today. So as I mentioned, C&D, a new uh, art center. So we're going to plan to build a museum for our artisan re residence program in the front, a parking structure for our employees uh, to, to have better vertical use of our property, and then the administrative offices all in one place. Uh, and then lastly, demolishing, you know, some of these legacy buildings, um, you know, that are not some of our best looking uh, buildings on the facility. What are you going to do with that property? Uh, that, so we're, our plans are to greenscape along the uh, tunnel uh, side and the Beatty side, so kind of create a, a green space and then have parking for both our employees and, and mostly fleet parking there. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do want to create a barrier between our industrial use and kind of the traffic that comes down those two corridors. So uh, this just shows kind of the area where we're planning to, um, you know, eliminate some of the legacy buildings. Um, just an overview, side by side comparison of what those two look like. Uh, and so this just gives you an overview of the timeline. Our goal is to finish the shop by the, you know, end of 2020, uh, relocate the C&D facility by the end of 2022, have the office building done by the end of 2021, and then once it's all said and done, we've moved out, probably demolished these legacy buildings as they're no longer necessary. So the maintenance facilities can be demolished once a new maintenance facility comes online. The office buildings can be demolished once a new office building comes online. Uh, and that's kind of the sequential order of, of events. Um, 
more of the same. So the benefits, you know, modernize the facility with more attractive buildings and the best available equipment. We're, we're anticipating to be able to process 50% more material and increase our diversion by 100% uh, from what we're getting today from the landfill. Uh, reduce vehicle miles traveled. So we are planning to sell our Golden Gate property in San Francisco, 907th Street, and consolidate uh, those operations onto the one property. That will mean approximately 150 trucks will no longer need to leave at the end of each day from our property, so less traffic at the end of the day. Uh, improve efficiency by consolidating operations, not have nearly as many shops, putting them all in one place. Uh, reduce noise, dust, and odor impacts. You know, more modern buildings like the West Wing uh, have modern uh, ventilation and uh, odor control systems, so our plan is to continue using solutions like that in our new uh, facilities. Uh, demolish old vacated buildings for on-site parking and landscaping, so you know we can we can do a better job of creating uh, berms and, and green space between us and and, and the street. Uh, and then lastly, just replace existing parking lot on Lathrop Avenue with the, with the green space buffer. So we have a lot of our own employees parking on the street kind of bring them into a parking structure so they're not parking on the street as much and, and create more parking for Caltrain train, um, customers and the community around us. So this just gives you an idea of what uh, you're probably familiar with, uh, the Beatty shop, uh, you know, right on the street. That's what it looks like today. There's an aerial in the bottom left-hand corner of the, where the new shop would go. Uh, and then as you see, can see, this is a kind of a rendering of the anticipated new shop green space along Beatty, uh, and then there's anticipated green space as, as, as you make that turn around Alana. Uh, it's a 61,000 square foot building. Uh, this, this is located in Brisbane. Uh, it'll improve our efficiency and also reduce the amount of cross traffic, um, the, the amount of truck traffic that comes across Beatty, uh, since we'll put all our maintenance facilities in one place on the same side of the street as our truck parking. Uh, and then, you know, relocate industrial vehicle path from Alana Beatty, uh, and, and so it'll reduce the road impacts on tunnel. Uh, this is the C&D facility. So as you can see, there's that maintenance facility in the bottom left-hand corner that we will uh, demolish, and then there's this a rendering of the new uh, C&D facility uh, called the East Wing. This is a 75,000-square-foot building on the east side of our transfer station. Uh, will allow for uh, fully enclosed operations and will reduce a noise, odor, and dust right now. Uh, if you think about where our C&D facility is, it's actually on the top of the, the, the hill that we have. This will actually bring the C&D, which is our noisiest operation, if you think about the material that we're dealing with, a lot of metal, rock, um, drywall, wood, you know, it's very loud pieces of material. It's going to actually bring that processing down lower in elevation. Um, you know, closer to the freeway where the sound impacts will, will be deadened. And then we're also going to build behind the building a uh, retaining wall uh, to, to keep that noise from getting to the little Hollywood neighborhood behind us. Uh, we'll have modern sorting uh, technology to replace our 20-year-old equipment. A lot has happened in this um, uh, recycling industry in the last 20 years. Uh, there's a, a lot of opportunity for us there. Um, and then lastly, and it'll allow for an expansion of our trash processing and our, our, our legacy uh, IMER facility. So um, that's what we look at as the future. And then uh, here's the office, artisan residence center and museum and uh, parking structure. So today, uh, largely a, a, a light industrial use, a lot of, uh, you know, storage. We go back there, we have uh, compost, you know, in the back a lot of trailers and, and um, you know, tractors behind that property. We're going to try to turn that into a buffer with a multi-story office building. Um, just better for the neighborhood um, and, and consolidates our operations under one roof. This is another view of what that might look like. Uh, 55, uh, 56,000 square feet, um, you know, 100,000 square feet parking structure, uh, you know, a lot of community benefits there. We're obviously going to have that uh, space available for the community. Uh, we, we currently do that in our, our facility at 401 now, but it will be a better space there. Again, a, a good buffer for between us and the community. Uh, and then, you know, on all the, par all the structures we're planning now, we have solar panels on top of all the buildings, uh, and we're going to pursue silver or gold. You know, we're a utility. We have 
ratepayers that we respond to, so we have to be conscientious about what we spend our money on, but we're definitely, as an environmentally conscious organization, want to do the most that we can with the money that we have for this. So uh, in terms of mitigation plans, uh, you know, our impacts to the, the neighborhood, the environment, and the, the cities that we're, we are in, um, all the buildings will be located on native rock, uh, so we're going to avoid exposing any historical landfills. Uh, we're not going to do any pile driving because we're going to be building on rock. So, uh, it, you know, me as someone that grew up in San Francisco, my greatest fear is, you know, earthquakes. And, um, you know, being on solid rock is really important for us because in, in the event of a disaster, we have to be ready to operate and so we'll be responsible for helping serve the communities that surround us. Um, and then we're going to look for opportunities to take construction and demolition debris that we receive and actually incorporating them into the design of our building. So the steel that we're going to use for the maintenance facility, we're going to try to source that from steel that we get from our uh, C&D operations. Uh, you know, some of the glass that uh, we receive as part of the recycling, they actually will pulverize small pieces of glass and put that into concrete. So we're going to be looking for opportunities to actually incorporate those recycled materials that we deal with every single day and put them into the construction of the facilities. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, dust uh, mitigation, uh, stormwater pollution protection, and anthropological study plans will all be conducted. <clears throat> so that was everything. I don't know how I'm doing on time. I said I had eight minutes. Hopefully I'm okay. All right. Uh, so any questions for me? What's IMR stand for? Integrated Material Recovery Facility. So I didn't come up with it. Um, no, I know. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you're, yeah, you know, a lot of jargon. It just Murph and then I Murph. I yeah. thought it was integrated, yeah. but you know. Okay. We love our, our jargon. So one question on the parking structure. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be on the Brisbane side. No, that that'll be in the San Francisco side. It's on the north property line. So the. Brisbane side is just going to be truck parking. No, it would be, a, well, it'd be the maintenance parking. facilities are kind of key right. uh, facility that will be on the Brisbane side. And that's going to replace a lot of maintenance facilities that are already existing in Brisbane as well that are a little older. That were never purposely built to be a maintenance facility. So for, sorry, Terry, was that your only question? I'll let you finish. I guess, I guess I'm not quite getting it. If you can go You're back. You're talking to about? To the left of the maintenance facility, Terry, looking at the map, that where the current buildings exist, that they're going to tear down, and there's going to parking that's going to go there is what you said, right? Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So I think uh, if if this is the slide, uh, the blue area, Terry, mm -hmm. council member, um, this is the area you're referring to. This will be largely truck parking, but you know, again, the hope is to put green space between the street and our truck parking so and the other portion that you own this the, year no the lower this yeah yes that that'll also be truck parking as well okay that's what i was asking oh, about sure. the truck parking in that's basically the brisbane side is correct going to be truck parking and a maintenance facility there yes How much do you anticipate the construction costs will be on the stuff that you're building in Brisbane? Uh, that's, uh, that's a good question. So I think the maintenance facility, and this does not, this is exclusive any dem demolition costs and any paving that we'll have to do. Maintenance, maintenance facility is about $28 million. And w that will trigger the public arts ordinance? Right? Looks like it will. Yeah, it should. I mean, it's over the, the limit. Okay. What's the limit? I just want to make sure. It's much lower than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. We're happy to, of course. It's like, what is it, a million? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to. We we happy to participate in that. Absolutely. Awesome. Anybody else? Oh, no. Yeah, I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, in regards to the the parking for the trucks. Mm-hmm. You'll have uh, solar panels above. That's a great question. Uh, I would actually really like to do that. We we have looked at that in the past. Um, right now, that is not currently contemplated. But we, I don't believe that we would not be able to do that. I, I would love to do that. I think that would be great. I yes. mean, you know, you're you know, you're creating this asphalt uh, parking mm -hmm. 
lot. Right. You know, it'd be great if it was covered with solar panels. I agree. Okay. Um, and then uh, just wanted to confirm that all of the um, waste processing will be fully enclosed? Correct. So no, no waste processing will be in the open? Correct. All being closed. Okay, yes. great. Yes. And then, um, you know, that was interesting that you said that your all of your buildings going to be on native rock. Because mm -hmm. I just assumed that it was all part of the bay fill. So based on say like one of your maps, so, do you know where the the you know the we've been the old shoreline was? Yes. So and it's I, I'm not don't hold me to this, but it it runs like that this if you can follow my this is things battery looks like it's dying runs like that so we're, we're just missing it and we have we've done borings over the years and we just finished doing more borings so we're very confident exactly where the native rock is but if you're familiar with this alana you can see rocks popping out of the ground over here hmm. um and, and so if you see where the new buildings are we're we're dancing right along that that former shoreline okay where the rock is all right and, and i'm sure that's a, a a major reason why you're redoing your your plans yes yeah okay and then um does recology have anaerobic digesters we do not is that something that recology is going to do This is not contemplated in the plan that we're presenting today. I, I don't believe that anaerobic digestion in our footprint makes sense today. Um, given the neighborhoods that will be kind of schlaglock development to our west and what will be happening to our southeast and southwest, I, I don't personally believe anaerobic digestion kind of fits. And then we've got little Hollywood to our north fits kind of our environment. Uh, we are looking at anaerobic digestion facilities uh, co-located at either a landfill or a composting facility. Uh, from, from my perspective, those happen in largely agricultural areas, um, you know, cow farms and such, where you can, you know, use that facility for multiple purposes. Um, I don't believe that anaerobic digestion makes sense. I mean, the, the South City scavengers have, they have anaerobic yes. digestion, right? right? And so we put all of our green waste into it, and it goes there and mm -hmm. creates the fuel for the trucks. Mm -hmm. um, but that isn't something that you guys are contemplating. Um, it, it takes a lot of, it takes a, a significant footprint. Uh, it's a significant um, investment in, in capital, and uh, there are some odor impacts. South San Francisco scavenger has the advantage of kind of being on the little on the peninsula. Uh, They're we're, isolated. We're, there are no homes out there. Exactly. There. Uh, we don't really have that luxury. If, okay. you, if you see what I'm saying. No, I, I do. I didn't know that those uh, facilities uh, created odor. Yeah. Yes, they do. Yes. Uh, okay. A good All right. All right. Yeah. I, I, again, don't hold me to, to this, but that's my position on the matter is that it doesn't make sense on our footprint. Okay. All right. Thank you. No problem. Good questions. Anybody else? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for the opportunity. Okay. Moving on to consent calendar. Do I have a motion to approve items A through D? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That brings us to new business. Item A, consider introduction of ordinance number 638, amending chapter 12.12 .12 of the municipal code establishing private tree regulations. Staff report, please. Uh, yes, thank you, honorable mayor, members of the council. Uh, in late 2017, the council directed um, staff to look at uh, updating the city's private tree regulations and a subcommittee of um, open space ecology and planning commission was formed to go over the issue and uh, resulted in uh, the recommendations you have before you tonight um, and again just to uh, the underlying purpose of the um, tree regulations is to balance you know keeping a healthy urban forest and balancing it with private property rights and that's was um, Sort of a precondition of the current ordinance and we tried to reflect that in the uh, in the update as well and I think part a lot of the ordinance update was primarily to provide more clarity and transparency uh, the other ordinance the old ordinance was somewhat difficult for staff to implement 
it was not very clear to applicants what their obligations were and the community's role in, in sort of the, the tree removal process was not specified at all. So I'll just go through some of the major changes and you can ask whatever questions you like. Um, so again, the applicability threshold of what it applies to hasn't changed. Some of the procedural requirements have. There was a ministerial permit before that had no discretion on the part of the city. So we changed that to a notification as opposed to a permit. Because again, since the city had no discretion, we didn't really feel there was much value in issuing a, a ministerial permit when there was no discretion on the part of the city. Um, we also you know, made it clear that that um, you could remove under a noticing requirement any number of invasive trees. Previously, a ministerial permit was limited the number of, of invasive trees that could be removed. We thought that was inappropriate, so we eliminated the, um, that uh, limitation. And then discretionary permit, there were some, um, you know, the protected tree is defined as shown on the screen. That basically uh, remained unchanged, again, with the um, exclusion of uh, excluding invasives as being protected trees. So those are no longer considered invasive, I mean, no longer considered protective under the new ordinance. The previous ordinance, they were considered um, protected. So we're eliminating that uh, pr provision as it relates to invasive trees. Can I ask a question? Sure. On the um, invasive trees, we're talking eucalyptus and uh, those type of trees. That's that's correct. It would be, um, it, there's actually a definition for invasives and it, it would be listed as an invasive species by, there's a couple different sources in California that are commonly used and, and not all eucalyptus are necessarily invasive, but the the ones that I think we see the most of around here are, in fact, invasive. Thank you. Uh, so back into the um, the tree removal that does require permitting. Um, before there was no public notification required, so we've added some provisions to uh, require notification of the city staff's determination. So neighbors do receive notice and they have the right to appeal a decision by the city to issue a tree removal permit. Um, there is also the current ordinance has kind of a mix of findings and criteria that were kind of mixed together. So we streamlined that into a single list of findings that would be um, uh, used to evaluate whether a tree removal permit should be evaluated. And some of the criteria related to trees being diseased, uh, proximity to structures that made them unsafe, uh, uh, require other requirements that affected um, the economic use of property, fire hazard, etc. Those were all criteria by which the city would grant a tree removal permit. So those are specified in the ordinance what those uh, criteria are. Um, there were other requirements that were um, somewhat discretionary. It wasn't clear, uh, particularly the replacement of trees. It was left on a case-by-case -case basis under the current ordinance. We decided that it would be more appropriate to just require that as a standard condition of approval. So instead of it being sort of a left on a case-by-case -case basis, the ordinance does require a tree replacement on a, on a, uh, as a requirement under the ordinance, uh, unless there's some sort of hardship that, that precludes that. Um, there were some additional recommendations from OSEC that weren't reflected in the ordinance that you have in front of you. Um, you know, there was some suggestions by that committee that, um, that the, uh, expanded the protected tree category in terms of the number and species should be broadened, the, the protections. That the size of the trees protected should be smaller than specified in the ordinance in front of you. And that some um, ongoing enforcement and inspection be required, uh, which would be somewhat a departure for how we do any of our permitting in the city. And lastly, there would provision or a suggestion that actual posting on trees to be removed be uh, required. And again, given that we are doing a public notice, we didn't see the value added of, of actually posting on individual trees. But all those kind of um, 
suggestions are up for the council's consideration without rem uh, recommending introduction of the ordinance as presented and we'll take any questions you might have council questions who would like to start me okay um I have some concerns John about uh, things that are going on in California relative to insurance cancellations and also some of the older larger trees in town creating issues for adjacent property owners and causing damage I don't didn't see any of that reflected anywhere have we talked to our fire chief to see how the fire department feel about all of this Um, we did not specifically um, uh, discuss this particular ordinance with um, the, with North County Fire. However, there are provisions for um, the conditions under which a tree can be removed. Fire hazard is one of the conditions or, or situations that would authorize, allow for the city to remove a tree. So if, if a property owner needed to remove a tree based on fire hazard issues, um, you know, they would basically put that in their application. We would consult with North County Fire on a case-by-case -case basis, ascertain if that reflects their professional judgment, and that would be, again, grounds for, for granting a tree removal permit. Okay. I'll go. So I noticed in your slides it said 20 inches, but in the staff report it says 24 inches. Uh, the staff report is incorrect. So it's 20 inches. 20 inches. That was the recommendation of open space and ecology. And so this might be a stupid question, but um, is there any indication on like a 20 inch circumference if like how old a tree is typically that would be that large or does that really depend on species? It's going to depend on the species. That's what I thought. Okay. Um, and then where, where was, is, where was the 300 foot, like how was that, that um, number arrived upon? So I, as I recall, it came through the subcommittee and there was some discussion about noticing for <clears throat> other types of planning applications as and, and so I think there was a takeoff from that initially there was some discussion about whether that should be just adjacent property owners but I right yeah. so is it as a radius that's a radius right okay and um, let's say that somebody that the notices go out and then somebody can essentially object to the tree being removed and then what happened like what's that process like they can file an appeal, which is an administrative appeal to the city manager. And what would be the grounds for, like, what would be a reason why people would want to prohibit this? Well, I mean, the the um, granting of a of a tree removal permit is subject to some certain findings that staff would make. You know, we make an evaluation. Yes, it meets this finding, which supports the tree removal. If someone is going to... Um, be aggrieved by that finding they would basically contend that that finding was not valid that was not a valid conclusion and they would make their case administratively to the city manager that that was a inappropriate finding to be made in the in the facts and currently we don't there isn't really a finding in place like there it's just people would l let you know that they need to remove the tree well, there's findings and criteria that are somewhat conflated and it's there, there are two lists in the current ordinance that are somewhat, there's some overlap and some inconsistency. So we're trying to streamline it into a very specific set of findings that everyone understands. If someone's going to make an application, what the city's going to evaluate it against. A neighbor understands clearly how the city made that evaluation and what our findings were clearly. And if they object to that, they have a, a, a path forward to, to make those objections known. And then for the replacement trees... Can you talk a little bit about like what what's expected? So if you remove a tree, 
talk walk me through how the replacement works so the um the ordinance has a minimum size criteria is a 15 gallon nursery size um and that's that's typical as you would find in in your non-commercial nurseries that's oh yeah big <laughs> and and so it's something that um that a owner essentially could do on their own without having to hire a contractor. So they would have that as a standard condition of approval. Another standard condition of approval is that it be done within 90 days, although there's a provision that the planning director could grant an, ex an extension to that upon request. And, and so that would allow for if there's perhaps a larger landscaping plan going on you could you could extend that out or if there's a seasonal issue that might be of concern for a certain species so but that would be the standard is 15 gallon within 90 days and that it would be per a plan that would be approved by the by the uh, by the city as well so it's not just a, a random placement in a random tree so we'd be looking at is this an invasive species? Is it uh, drought tolerant? Is it suitable to the the uh, location? And then I noticed in the staff report that there was um, discussion about planting that elsewhere, um, which was also in the slides. So can you indicate like what would be a situation in which someone would get approved to plant a tree not on their property and where that might go an example that comes to mind is up on king's road for instance you have some sites that are already very densely forested if you will i don't know right. that they're even planted but but a lot of i, I think um, uh, oaks perhaps that have spread over the years and so it may not be appropriate to take a tree out and then plant another in, in an already dense area. And so in that kind of case, they could um, request that it be a in lieu planting somewhere else. And it would be somewhere or a like city fee. property or like how would we determine where that tree would go? That so there's two different mechanisms. One would be if they had something in mind, um, it, it would go to the the city and I, I think we'd probably coordinate with public works on that but I think probably more commonly is they would pay a, a uh, in lieu fee and um, and that would go into a fund for city tree planting elsewhere in the city and if they wanted to say plant it elsewhere in the city um, would the city pick the tree or would they pick the kind of tree I would say the city would pick the tree those are all my questions. Anybody else? No, I, I remember when uh, we went through this <laughs> many years ago and uh, did an update, comprehensive update, and uh, it, you know, going through it, it's nice to see that it's actually pretty much uh, hasn't changed a whole lot. So you know, I think we got it pretty well the first time around that we did a real, and that was a, a long process, I recall. So. I don't have any questions. Right. Yeah, I got a question. So, um, you know, I just wanted to follow up on that, that noticing to your neighbors, uh, you know, um, the question that uh, the mayor had brought up. So um, if there's a property owner, they have a tree that they want removed, I guess if it's over the, the 24 inches. If it's considered a protected tree and they need a an official min, uh, permit, then yes, that would trigger the notification. Okay, but if it's a, an invasive tree, there's no notification. Correct. And and this whole thing about notification required, there's a whole sort of series of, you know, for severe trimming and whatnot. Those are not public notifications. That's those those are actually notifications to staff to verify that indeed it is not a protected tree. We want we don't want to rely on a homeowner necessarily say well this isn't a protected tree and so i did this they need to provide some notification to the city we verify that it is not a protected tree and that's really the notification to the city so the 
you know, when a protected tree is going to be removed and is subject to a formal permit and formal findings, that is what triggers the, the neighborhood notification. Got it, got it. And so um, if there was, say, a large invasive or non-native tree that needed to be removed, I mean, chances are you'd probably have to close part of the street, get the big rig in, and so that would requ require the permits to go through the city. I think we're talking about two different activities. One, if there's any work in the right of way or requires street closure, that's a whole separate permitting requirement through public works. Um, if it's just a matter of if it's, a, and I don't want to conflate um, non native and invasive because I think the ordinance, the exemptions relate very much specifically to invasive trees. Those are kind of exempt from a lot of the permitting requirements, not necessarily non natives. Okay. All right. Thank you. I have another question if everyone's done. Go ahead. So some of the trees that we plant in town end up massive. And so if they've got a 100-foot canopy, um, chances are their root base underground is also 100 feet. What are we doing to advise people on what trees are not going to get that huge that could potentially cause problems for other properties? You know what I'm saying? Right, so so this goes back to the the planting plan that they would have to provide, the, the replanting plan is is to show what species and so so staff would, would check um, what the literature says uh, and, and staff's experience about the specific species that's being requested and, and help guide the applicant if it looks inappropriate to the site. Yeah. And I think uh, Council Member Cunningham's comment also raises probably something we could do a better job of it's providing information to the public that isn't maybe tied, maybe someone's not removing a tree, they don't need a city permit per se, but maybe they just want information as to what is the appropriate species. And I think there are resources we could make available online where people could could get some guidance as to what's an appropriate species, right. tree height, uh, you know, root characteristics, et cetera. I think there's those kind of resources we can make available on the website. That, that would be great because, you know, a lot of the trees that we planted 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago are trees that are now causing uh, damage to other properties. So I think if we, we did give some guidance would be really great. Thanks, John. So. So we did not list out the invasive species in this. It's an attachment somewhere else. We have, let me find it here, on page eight of your staff report. This is section 1212040D. It refers to invasive species um, that are it, it actually calls out a couple organizations, Invasive Species Council of California and the California In Invasive Plant Council. So these are a couple sources that staff is already using when, when we look at, at trees that people are proposing or, or the whole land. Okay, but we didn't, we didn't incorporate the list into this. No, because it'd be too broad and it changes over time as well. Okay, uh, that was just... I didn't see it, but I wanted to make sure that I had seen it, if it was there. Anyone else? I'm good, thanks. Okay. So. I make a motion to introduce ordinance number 638. So I had comment no, oh. instead of questions for staff. Me too. Okay. Yeah. If we may. Well, let me just note that we are available for public comment. There's nobody in the room, but I think it's important to just say that first before we get into discussion. Um, so there are some things that I think could be tweaked here, but I'll go ahead and I know that you have some comments, so why don't you start? One of the things that I just wanted to share is in other cities that I travel through, I do see when some tree that's considered a heritage tree is up for removal. And I think that really does give a heads up to the community 
and if they have a concern, people who are out walking and see the red tag on a tree actually stop and look. It's sort of like the lost pet. Even if you haven't seen a pet, you know, you, you stop and you see that. And I think that having that notification, at least on trees that are visible from the street, are, is, is really important because it will s change the dialogue where if you walk by and you see a big tree that you maybe are fond of or hate, either one, um, and you see a notice on it, you can start that conversation before it starts getting cut down. And so I think that it, it sort of mitigates some of the complaints that we've seen in the past of all of a sudden a tree is removed and everybody's saying, what happened here? How did that happen? How did I not know of it? And so even for people who get notices in their water bills that don't get looked at, you know, if you see a red sign on a tree, you're, you're gonna notice it and you may have an opportunity to mitigate the complaint before it happens. So. Yeah, and just just for clarity, I mean, so the the notice would only be on uh, the the handful of of native trees, no other trees. trees. Well, I just have oak to, and the, the. We would suggest if you're going that. to do that, anything that's considered a protected tree that needs a permit for removal. I mean, I guess you could say it's just going to be the natives, but you know there are other types of trees that require a permit. So if you either want all of them posted or if you want some subset, you know, you should specify that, whatever your intent is. Okay. All right. I'm just, I just want to be clear, though, what the recommendation was from the OSEC. Was OSEC's the recommendation one. was for all trees that are subject to a permit to have on each specific tree a notice on it. You're talking about every tree in Brisbane? Every tree that... So any tree that somebody applies to have removed that before it's removed, oh, I see. I any, post a notice on it. Any big protected or any tree that is big enough to require a permit would be an, have a notification. Correct. That's correct. Right. Anything that's subject to a discretionary permit under the ordinance, they wanted to have a notice on it. So um, you're, Terry, you're asking that it be put on a tree before, it, if it's in question. Is that it? Not, not just Males. put a notice on every tree. No, 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 not a notice on every. Okay. Tree. Any tree that is, tr that uh, is tagged that for removal. <laughs> tagged for removal, just okay. like that requires a permit. That this way it doesn't come as a shock to. What any if it's on neighbors? someone's backyard? Like, well, they're going to go out in their backyard and put a thing back there? I think for the most part, most people complain about the trees, the scape that they see from the street. Um, so I think we should make that clear, though, because somebody might have one in their backyard where even if they tacked a notice to it, nobody would see it. Nobody would see it in your backyard. So my concern is that... I'm just concerned that with so many hoops that I feel like have been created through this process, it's going to discourage people from addressing the problematic trees that they have. And I can see like a whole planning commission showdown where someone wants to ta handle a tree that really should come, that should be removed for whatever reason, and then have all of these neighbors get involved in what becomes a tr long drawn out incident when somebody you know I, I don't want to make it too challenging for people to address their tree problems because it is a fact in Brisbane that we have a lot of trees that haven't been maintained and a lot of trees that roots are growing too big or their limbs are falling onto other houses and we have many trees that really should be removed and I think that the more requirements and the more hoops that we make people jump through I think the harder it is going to be to get people to actually take care of those things so on one hand I really value 
protecting you know these trees that are so important to our mountain and our ecosystem but at the same time i also don't want to deter people from taking the steps that are really necessary um so to me the 300 foot radius of like letting everybody know i think people really should be able to do what they want to do on their private property in a safe way um and so i i i personally feel that the more that we try to disrupt that um i just don't feel like it's really our place and um also i do not think that we need to post um on the site it says osec recommended that permits be required to be posted and visible on the site for each specific tree so if we don't make if we don't send out the 300 square the 300 foot radius um notices then i could see those being posted to our website but i wouldn't see a need for them simultaneously i think that it should suffice if the 300 foot radius those people are noticed um i don't think we need both and then um Yeah, I understand where with the replacement trees, but I also think we have to be careful because I just am concerned that there are some places in Brisbane that have too much foliage um, that may be problematic. So provided that staff, you know, can help give recommendations, there may be somebody who's willing to put something on their property and you might want to, you know, staff might discourage that and have them put it somewhere else. Um, and I also, you know, I just don't want all these requirements to also be too expensive for the homeowner. And I know that there are measures where people can demonstrate a financial hardship. I think it would be good to understand exactly, you know, what would constitute a financial hardship and what sort of documentation they would need to show and what would be the what would be the income, you know, um, minimum that would be required in order to qualify as a hardship. So I think all of those things are also, you know, things that I'm concerned about too. Um, but the rest of it is fine by me. So if I, if I understand what you're saying, Madam Mayor, is that, um, the 300 uh, foot uh, notification that's in the um, in the recommendation that's coming from the Planning Commission, as well as the additional OSEC suggestions, you would want those taken out, and then everything else is good with you. I would. I would be more. Um, I would be more interested in terry's recommendation of posting physically onto the tree um or maybe reducing the 300 foot radius i just think it's quite large um and i'm okay with posting the permits to the city website if there is no there is no notification in that radius but it's like one or the other i don't really feel like there needs to be both you know what I mean? I just don't want to create a situation where we're making it difficult for people to address the very real problems on their property. So, so a question for staff perhaps is how um, laborious is the current or would this put on staff and the public for a tree removal? What would be the process and the fees involved with getting this process moved forward? We, again, we, we would, the next step in this, if whatever ordinance the council approves, we would look into modifying the, the permit fees. Um, certainly by adding notification requirements, that adds cost. That's, to me, the primarily cost driver of that would increase the cost of a permit application is now we do have to do a notice if there has to be some sort of posting on site and that's going to be staff time to go out and verify that posting has been done those are things that add cost to the to a permit but so the rest of it in terms of the findings and whatnot that's not currently to for 
for a resident who has a tree they want to remove that's big tree, um, non a uh, non-invasive tree that would require a permit. They would come and make an application and pay a f currently may pay a fee or would pay a fee of. Well, that's um, kind of an interesting thing. Because right now, there is no cost recovery for the city. There's no okay. fee for a tree removal, and that's something. So, but they come and ask for a permit for a tree removal currently. Correct. And if the city says yes, your tree is dead, go for it, or we need to look into it, that triggers a process that may take some some documentation we may require an arborist report we may need to see a tree replacement plan um you know again our certainly our fee ordinance doesn't reflect any of the time city staff spends on this uh, particular permitting effort and it currently is it a a large chunk of staff time working with trees uh typically no typically like if if somebody comes with a non-protected tree application, it's it's less than an hour. Um, I'll go up and actually verify on site, um, write a quick letter with standard conditions about such things as right of way and such, and they get a letter and they're good to go. It's pretty quick, but it ranges. You have others where if you're getting um, multiple trees or commercial situations and, and so there might be some follow-up in terms of are they planting is there a requirement to replant and and so it, it varies a bit but typically they're less than an hour of time for staff part okay and then also if you had to get an arborist report that would probably increase the cost so how much would that something like that run do you have any sense i i don't I've never hired an arborist, but I'm guessing that their hourly rate is be hundred between a hundred and two hundred an hour. If I if I had to guess, they're a, a certified professional, and they'd they'd need to come out, visit the site, write it up. So do we think that would be a common several. occurrence, or do you think that that would be a pretty rare situation in which that would be needed? Currently, it's pretty rare, and I I think it's um, it really. I see it more coming in with sensitive issues where we're, we're in disagreement perhaps about it, whether huh. a tree really should or a group of trees should come so, down. So normally if I were to have a tree that needed to be removed, I would call Davy Tree or whoever and they would come out and look at your tree and say, okay, 100 foot pine tree and give you a quote and give you why it was being removed to a certain degree so that would be a pretty normal first step on anyone who's contemplating taking out a big tree so I think that that is sort of goes along with these regulations that they could come in with that report from Davy tree or whoever and would have at least an idea of what the cost the height the size and would have a lot of that information for a big tree that was going to be professionally removed right so so a lot of times on these large trees like the pines for instance it's so obvious that it does need to be removed that that staff is not going to ask for an arborist report so uh, Davy tree has arborists or at least one arborist on staff probably m multiple um, and and so if if there is a need for an arborist oftentimes that's actually handled so up front and they may actually even include that in in the application right up front so with the um right now that you you said it doesn't cost money f for this process but under the new conditions how much would we anticipate charging i i think staff would need to look a little bit deeper at that and you might have a tiered kind of I think the notice only if you if you want to stay with that I I would suggest there's no cost for them to do a notice um, with a a new discretionary permit process where we're putting out notices now to the community 
or some extra time in that. I, I would think just kind of spitballing a number, maybe a, a few hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars. It Plus the cost depends on how much council, I guess, how much appetite you have for full cost recovery. Okay. Madam Mayor, I have a question sure. Council. So we do have a proposal before us. So what and where are you suggesting to change? Well, I haven't really heard Karen's perspective yet. So I'm kind of interested in hearing where everyone in the group is at because that will really help me figure out, you know, where we need to go with this. So my only additional comment to all of this is, you know, given that Brisbane has now been upped in its fire ante, according to all the insurance companies. Is it, is it wise for us to even recommend planting trees on the upper streets or the streets that might be um, considered a higher fire hazard? Um, the in lieu of and moving a tree elsewhere might be um, somehow a better recommendation for, I mean, anything above, obviously, Sierra Point. So we're suggesting there are streets that be exempt to the requirement, replanting requirement? Well, I, I'm thinking that, you know, moving forward, given the information that we have from, you know, all of the insurance companies, that they're going to discourage big canopy trees on our high streets because we're now considered high fire risk. So, and you know, whether that's true or not, that's, they're in the I fire would. business and last year cost them a lot of money and they're trying to cover their bases. So I don't want us in a situation <coughs> where we're telling people, you got to plant a tree up on Kings Road or anything above Sierra Point at this point <coughs> um, to their detriment, whatever that might look like insurance wise, et cetera. I, I would assume that some trees are more flammable than others, and you know many trees survive um, fire situations because if they're maintained and they're not ignitable matchsticks, they um, they're made to burn. You know, they're the fire burns cooler underneath their canopies than they do. Um, in other situations. So I would hate to be discouraging trees um, in our community because I think they're so important. I, I wouldn't be discouraging it. So maybe what, uh, what about the idea of having like a specific list of trees that people can replant, but then also are, they're sensitive to like well, you know, fire conditions. That's that's why I asked if we'd had the um, fire chief involved because I remember having a conversation with him some years ago, um, and him saying, you know, some people are under the misconception that tree A, B, and C burn faster than tree D, E, and F, and in fact that's not true. So I I would feel more comfortable having some input from our fire chief, quite frankly. <coughs> I think there are two ways of doing this. One is, you know, again, whether or not you want to put a list, a very static list in an ordinance that may get updated and changed over time, or if your policy direction is that you want, you know, input from from um, the fire marshal and, and the use of sort of low flammability trees, you know, that can be embedded into the ordinances. Again, criteria or things to consider in areas that are, you know, high fire severity zones or whatnot as mapped. If those are kind of your goals and objectives as opposed to the idea of whenever you put a list together, the list eventually, sometimes very shortly, goes out of date. And then we're back to falsely believing that the list you have in an ordinance you adopted 12 years ago is the end all be all of lists. So I'm not a real fan of that, frankly, but the idea of the policy direction and the guidance I think is very you know, germane and, and a little easier for us to administer over time. Mm -hmm. okay. So did when the Planning Commission reviewed this, did they ask for any information from fire safety or? That that was not brought up in the subcommittee or with the 
the two bodies, OSEC or Planning Commission, I, I think it's it's um, it's one is the taking out of of those trees that are a fire hazard, and I I, I think that's left largely unchanged.